families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello everyone and welcome to Families Divided TV. In tonight's episode, Dr. Mindy Matheson gives a summary of the findings from her research. She has interviewed and collected data from adult alienated children, targeted parents, and targeted grandparents to learn more about their experiences, how they cope, and what is needed to better support them and address parental alienation and grandparent alienation. In this presentation, Dr. Matheson shares what she has learned from research participants about how to cope in response to parental alienating behaviors. It's quite interesting, so I'm sure you're going to get much out of this. So we're going to be back right after this important message with Dr. Mandy Matheson. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. Hello, I'm Dr. Mandy Matthewson, and today I'm going to talk about some of my research and some of the recommendations that have come out of the research that I've been conducting at the University of Tasmania. So I'm going to talk about five research projects we've been working on for the last few years. I'll talk to you about the Not Forgotten Child Studies, so this is research where we have interviewed adults who were alienated from a parent during childhood uh, as a result of being exposed to parental alienating behaviours. I'll also talk about the forgotten parent studies. So this is a series of studies that we've been conducting for a while where we have interviewed uh, targeted parents, so parents who were alienated from a child because of exposure to parental alienating behaviours. And we've also asked them in the past to complete different questionnaires or surveys. So we have a lot of information from that study. We've also conducted a small study looking at the grandparent experience of being alienated from their grandchild as a result of exposure to parental alienating behaviours. We'll also talk about a recent study that has just recently been published a couple of months ago where we interviewed people, so both the adult alienated children and the targeted parents who have reunified with each other after a period of parental alienation. And I'll also provide a summary of uh, some research that we conducted looking at what are the best evidence-based interventions for parental alienation and what are the essential ingredients that these interventions have that lead to effective or good outcomes. So I'll begin with the Not Forgotten Child study. So again, we interviewed adults who said that they had been alienated from a parent during childhood as a result of being exposed to parental alienating behaviours. We had a sample of 20 participants, which might sound small, but it's actually quite a good number uh, for an interview-based study. We had participants with a range of ages from all over the world. Some of these participants had reunified with their targeted parent and some of them hadn't. So in terms of what we found, we we found a lot. And it was some of the stories, all of the stories were quite heartbreaking. 
So we found evidence that parental alienating behaviours can be considered an insidious form of abuse. And at the heart of the parental alienating behaviours is coercive control. But what we also found is that exposure to parental alienating behaviours can just be the tip of the iceberg. Many of these participants also talked about being exposed to other forms of child abuse. So some of them had been exposed to physical abuse perpetrated by the alienating parent. They described quite a significant level of neglect where once they were in the full-time care of the alienating parent, the alienating parent was unable to effectively parent them for various reasons. We also found some evidence of financial control and in some cases the neglect that the children experienced then left them vulnerable to other types of abuses, um, such as sexual abuse. So really what we found was quite a, a large amount of abusive behaviours that seemed to occur alongside the abusive behaviours of parental alienating behaviours. This, of course, had a significant impact on the adult alienated child's life. So when we looked at the pattern of mental health difficulties that they reported, they reported experiencing things like depression, uh, ADHD, anxiety, a lot of um, dysregulation. So some of them talked about having symptoms that they thought might be consistent with uh, adult ADHD. But we, well, essentially, when we looked at the cluster of the difficulties that they were reporting, it seemed to be that their symptoms were consistent with complex trauma reactions. So they seemed to report all the different types of trauma reactions that we see in other adults who have been exposed to other forms of abuse during childhood. So the kinds of abuses that these children were experiencing, but without the parental alienating behaviours. So, of course, this has had quite an impact on the trajectory of these participants' lives. So for many of them, they had a difficult time focusing on school because when you are focused on just surviving in a household that's full of abuse, it's very difficult to focus on school, whereas some of them found that they needed to hyper-focus on school because it was the only place where they felt safe and where they could control what was happening to them. Of course, the way that the um, their experience impacted on their capacity to engage in school impacted on some people's employment opportunities later. What we found is it had a significant impact on their capacity to form adult relationships. So many of them had talked about just not being able to identify indicators of tendency for someone to be abusive when they entered into romantic relationships later on in life. So some of them talked about how they repartnered with people or they partnered with people in adulthood who looked very similar to their alienating parent. And of course what that meant was that some of these participants then talked about how they then went on to be alienated from their own children so they married someone or had children with someone who was capable of using all of the same sorts of parental alienating behaviours and family violence type behaviours that their alienating parent used. So what we saw was evidence of an intergenerational transmission of parental alienation. But coming back to the impact on relationships, it certainly did have an impact on many of the relationships that the participants talked about. They talked about being unable to trust other people because they had been so hurt during childhood. And they also talked about not really being able to trust themselves in their own judgment, which I think is quite consistent with the experiences of people who have been coercively controlled and who have had situations where their reality has been corrupted through lies and manipulation and psychological 
um, abuse. What we did find was there was absolutely a need for intervention. So there's a need for early intervention to prevent this from happening and to prevent this cascade of difficulties for these children as they grow into adulthood. But also there is a group of people who have been harmed by exposure to parental alienating behaviours and all of the other abusive behaviours that might come alongside it. And so there needs to be good evidence-based interventions for those adults who are trying to recover from the trauma that they have experienced in childhood. So what I have on the side of the slides that you might be seeing there are some of the quotes from some of the interviews that we did with uh, the adult alienated children. So then if we move to the forgotten parent study. So here we interviewed a total of 89 people. They said that they were alienated from a child because of exposure to parental alienating behaviours. And we also have some other studies where we asked targeted parents to complete a different surveys to find out more about their experience. So what I'm going to talk about is, I guess, a summary of all of those studies so far. And I'll focus on how they described their experience, but also the coping strategies that they used to, I guess, try and manage the situation that they were in. So both the helpful coping strategies and the unhelpful coping strategies we identified. Again, we found evidence in this research that parental alienating behaviours are an insidious form of family violence. And so many of our participants reported that before the relationship ended with the alienating parent, that that alienating parent had perpetrated other types of violence against them before family separation. And for some of the targeted parents, they said that was the reason why they left the relationship to, I guess, find a place of safety. And then that abuse and coercive control continued after family separation and then the alienating parent used the child as part of that coercive control. The parents we interviewed reported experiencing all kinds of family violence. So they reported uh, coercive control, psychological abuse and manipulation, physical violence perpetrated by the alienating parent uh, some of them talked about sexual violence, financial control. And so there were parents who were very concerned about the welfare of their children in that situation. What we also found is that all of the participants tended to talk about their grief for their lost child who was still alive. And they talked about the complexities of that grief experience. So it was a grief that other people didn't understand, even people close to them didn't necessarily understand. They talked about a grief that just wasn't acknowledged and a grief that um, where there was just no support and also a grief that was denied. So they felt like there was nowhere, sometimes they felt like there was nowhere for them to turn to get the support and acknowledgement and just someone to say that I hear and I understand. So they talked about very complex grief reactions. And of course, those grief reactions and their trauma experiences were then compounded by trying to use the services that they initially thought would be there to help them and their children. So I don't think anybody in our sample talked about having a positive experience with the family court. Uh, I think they all talked about how that compounded their distress and their trauma and their grief and loss experience. Some people talked about having access to mental health services and for some of them they said that that was a really important, useful and healing experience, but for some they found it very difficult to find a practitioner who had enough knowledge of parental alienating behaviours and their impact and then that impacted on their ability to engage with that practitioner and trust that practitioner and then work with them in a productive way. Really concerningly, we found that 23% of 
of the participants we interviewed had attempted suicide that they said was as a result of their distress from this experience. And some of these participants had attempted suicide multiple times. 44% of our participants said that they were not coping well at all. And we had 59% said that they were in financial crisis because they had spent so much money trying to just be a parent to their children. So some of our participants had spent enormous sums of money and they're, they're fighting the courts to just have some time with their children and parent their children came at considerable personal and financial cost. What we did find is our parents we interviewed were very active in their attempts to reunite with their children. They were trying or had tried absolutely everything that they could think of. Some were still trying and some parents had come to the realisation that there was nothing more that they could do and that they had to make that decision to stop the legal fight and to try something else. And for some of those participants, that something else was focusing on their own healing so that they could be well and they could live as best as they could under the circumstances and be ready for the time that their child might make an approach to them in the future. So when we looked at the types of coping strategies that parents were using, some talked about engaging in intellectual activities, so going back to study, studying different topics. Some were studying to then become either a legal or mental health practitioner to then come back and work in the, this area to try and make a difference. Or some were just choosing to study something of interest to try and keep themselves distracted. Some people talked about the benefits of social interaction and said that they had good social support networks that they were able to lean into. But some said that their social support networks had changed as a result of family separation and parental alienating behaviours, that they had lost members of their social support network or their support network just didn't understand and they found it difficult to, I guess, have conversations with them about their experience because sometimes well-meaning friends or family would give advice, but that advice was unhelpful. Some participants talked about physical activity and engaging in regular exercise and the powerful benefits of that to them. And some of them talked about being quite active spiritually and really leaning into their belief systems or their church communities as a way of support. Some of our participants also talked about being busy with work. So they distracted themselves by just really fixating on work and working really hard. And for some, that was a choice that they made under the circumstances that they were in and they used it to distract themselves. But for some, they had to work because they're in such financial difficulty. And people talked about various hobbies that they also used to distract themselves and to help them regulate themselves and to wind down their nervous systems from their traumatic experience. In addition to some support, whether it be helpful or unhelpful, from family and friends. Some also talked about the practitioners that they had seen and the help or otherwise that they received from the practitioners. So what seemed to be key there is that targeted parents really benefited from finding the right practitioner who seemed to have enough knowledge of parental alienating behaviours and their impact and also that that targeted parent was able to trust and know that they would be listened to and that they would be believed and that that practitioner would provide the care and the support that they needed. So then if we move on to the grandparent study, so here we interviewed a small group of grandparents who had been alienated from their grandchildren as a result of parental alienating behaviours. With this study, we focused on the experience of the parents of the targeted parents. 
So we also acknowledge that sometimes the parents of the alienating parent can also be alienated from the children because for alienating parents, if a person, regardless of how close they are to them, isn't considered their ally, then that parent will consider that person to be against them and they will cut all ties. So if an alienating parent's parent isn't perceived to be an ally of the alienating parent, then they too will cut that person out of their life. But for this study, we focused on the parents of the targeted parents. What we found is that the parents, the grandparents we interviewed reported being exposed to all of the types of alienating behaviours used by the alienating parent that we see being reported by alien, adult alienated children and targeted parents. So they too are on the receiving end of these abusive behaviours. What we also found is that they talked about having this compounded grief experience. So they talked about not only grieving for the loss of their grandchild, but also grieving for the fact that they may not ever see that grandchild again before they die. They also talked about the grief and loss associated with losing their own child as they knew them because of the changes that had occurred in their child, their own child, the targeted parent, as a result of that experience. They also talked about their own financial losses because many of the people that we interviewed said that they had part funded some of the legal fight for their child to have access or to parent their child. So some of our grandparents had to return to work or were unable to retire when they had planned to because they needed to work to either continue to fund the legal fight or to recover some of the costs that they had spent. But also they talked about the losses associated with not being able to leave a legacy to their child and their grandchildren because of the losses that they'd faced as a result of this experience. Some grandparents also talked about feeling caught in the middle and so they were caught in trying to support their child and be their child's ally but also trying to navigate a very difficult relationship with the alienating parent just so they could have some time with their grandchild and then the impact that that had on their relationship with their own child. So for grandparents, their experience is very complicated and very difficult and another experience of, um, I guess, a disenfranchised grief for many losses. But then let me talk about the reunification study. So here we talked about the experiences of voluntary reunification after a period of parental alienation. So this is when the parent and the adult alienated children made their way to each other without any particular formal intervention strategy. So we interviewed the adult alienated children and we interviewed targeted parents. Now, in some cases, we were able to interview the parent-child dyad, and in other cases, we couldn't get the dyad, so we just interviewed either a child or a parent and they weren't necessarily related to each other. This is the first study that we're aware of that explored the reunification experience from both perspectives. And we certainly found some really interesting things when you bring the two perspectives together. So what we found is that there is this approach withdrawal cycle that many of the alienated children will do. So they might make an approach to the target parent and then withdraw. And the targeted parent may not hear from that child again for a very long time. And then this can cycle for many years. So it's almost as though the child is then testing the waters and seeing if it's safe and then retreating. And testing the waters again, seeing if it's safe and then retreating. 
And also for some of the alienated children, they're still being exposed to the parental alienating behaviours and that also impacts on their capacity to maintain steady contact with the targeted parent. So even when the child is an adult, the alienating parent's reach into their lives doesn't stop. We also, um, there were a couple of stories there where the reach of the alienating parent continued even after that parent had died. And that's simply because when that parent dies, the impacts of the coercive control and the emotional manipulation doesn't stop. So for targeted parents, they need to be prepared for this approach withdrawal cycle that can go on for a very long time. And they also need to manage that. So for the parents, it's this process of getting their hopes up and then having them dashed again. And so they really are on this reunification roller coaster ride that can be quite distressing. What we did find is that the process needs to be driven by the child. You need to go at the child's pace because if you go too fast too soon for the child, you will overwhelm them and they will withdraw and you don't know how long they'll be withdrawn for. So parents need to be very slow and steady in this process. And of course, the complex trauma reactions of both the parent and the child can impact negatively on this experience. So for many parents, well, for all of the parents we interviewed, their child was not the same child from before the alienation. They are now interacting with someone who is quite traumatised. But also the targeted parent can be very traumatised. And so if the targeted parent is very reactive and distressed and tries to have the conversation around, let me tell you about what things were like for me, let me tell you the real story of what happened, it will just overwhelm the child and the child will, will retreat and may not come back. So it's very important you take it slowly and every time a child has an approach, the targeted parent needs to act with same loving kindness and compassion each time. The targeted parent needs to have a good toolkit of coping resources to be able to manage this. And it really helps if they are supported by a practitioner, a mental health practitioner who knows something about this, to be able to support them through the process. Uh, also, the alienated child could benefit from also having the support of a good practitioner who can help them um, make sense of the experience that they're having because it's a very powerful one for them as well. The alienated child's capacity to implement boundaries during this process can also be limited and impact on the reunification process. So many of the alienated children have not learnt what good healthy boundaries look like. And so they bring that experience to the relationship with the targeted parent. And so it, it might be the role of the targeted parent to very gently teach and model what healthy boundaries look like. And they include healthy self-care boundaries, but also healthy boundaries around this is what a healthy relationship looks like. It looks like kindness. It looks like compassion. It looks like understanding. So for some parents, they have difficulty putting in place healthy relationship boundaries with their child because then they're afraid that, that child will react badly and disappear. And so for some parents, they need to make a decision about whether they want their relationship with their child to be contingent on unhealthy boundaries and unhealthy interaction patterns or whether they want to persist in modelling and teaching what a healthy relationship looks like. I've already mentioned the ongoing pressure of parental alienating behaviours, but they are ever present through this process. And the alienating parent may try to influence, prevent, sabotage this reunification process. 
And so sometimes you might, the target parent might have some contact with the child and then it stops. That might just be because the alienating parent is controlling and monitoring the behaviours of the child. So the child then can't make further contact. What is really important is for both parties need to have really good self-care. They really need to look after themselves through this very difficult process. And really importantly, they need to keep living their lives and never give up because you just don't know what the future holds. So on a different note, the intervention study. We decided to find out what are the evidence-based interventions for parental alienation. So we reviewed, we reviewed the literature to find out what's available and there are many interventions available that are being described in the peer review literature. And we wanted to know how effective are they in restoring relationships and resolving psychological difficulties that come along with parental alienation. And we wanted to make recommendations around what are the best intervention strategies, what are the ingredients of the interventions that are really important. So when you consider the findings of the four research studies that I've just described, and you consider the things that we found in the literature about best practice in intervening in parental alienation, it's really important that parental alienation is considered a child protection issue. So any intervention must start there and the child must be protected from any further harm. This might mean changes in custody arrangements. So it might mean that the child then needs to go into the care of the targeted parent while the alienating parent addresses their behaviours and then is ready to support the relationship between the child and the other parent. Some parent, alienating parents, though, have difficulty coming to that point. And so then the court needs to make a decision accordingly around what is best in that situation. And it may be that the child then needs to stay in the care of the targeted parent. There must be a coordinated approach between um, the legal system and the therapeutic mental health systems. There needs to be this coordination between the two. They need to work together. If there's disconnect between the two, it won't work. There needs to be strict vis visitation schedules and custody arrangements put in place. They need to be very clear so that they can't be misinterpreted, exploited or rearranged by an alienating parent. There also needs to be court mandated, the intervention needs to be court mandated because the outcome of the intervention is something that the alienating parent does not want. So there needs to be an external motivator for them to come along and be part of it. But there also needs to be some court sanctions for non-compliance. The interventions need to work to improve the children's psychological well-being. So you need to address the trauma that they have experienced. You need to support the targeted parent in building that relationship with a now traumatised child, which means helping them to deal with their trauma reaction so that doesn't negatively impact on their relationship with the child. So, and you also need to have some sort of intervention for the alienating parent. It's important that they're included in the process as much as they're willing to engage um, because the ultimate goal is for that child to be able to have a relationship with both parents. The successful reunification looks like a situation where a child can have a relationship with both parents when it is safe for them to do so. But for some alienating parents, they choose to do everything but engage in the intervention and everything but um, having a healthy relationship with their child. If you can repair and move to a co-parenting relationship with the children, that is the best ultimate goal. But a parallel parenting situation might be more realistic or it might be but if we consider this a child protection issue, particularly in severe cases, that 
that child needs to remain in the care of the targeted parent. But if you can establish healthy boundaries and communication within the family, that's a really important part of the interventions. So in terms of recommendations for all involved, the alienated child, the targeted parent, the targeted grandparents, they can get professional support that can be very helpful because all three have had a traumatic experience and they need time to heal and it can help if they have the support of someone who's trained in helping them to heal. Good if they can all build a good support network around them and really focus on self-care and looking after themselves so that they're in the best position to then rebuild relationships. It's really important that all three then learn something about parental alienating behaviours and the impact, so what they are, how they can impact and how you can heal from them. So knowledge in this situation is power, but also the right knowledge. So good, evidence-based, accurate knowledge because there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. For the child, reconnect with others when they are ready. And for the parents and the grandparents, really focus on healing and recovery so that you are as well as you can be for when the child comes back into your life. So they are the best recommendations that I can make from the research that we have. We are still researching. There is more to come and there's more to be published, but we hope that our studies are the beginning of some change. And if you'd like to know more, we also have a co-authored book, Understanding and Managing Parental Alienation, A Guide to Assessment and Intervention. We wrote this book for both practitioners, mental health and legal practitioners, but also for people who um, have been exposed to parental alienating behaviours, so we tried to make it accessible to as many people as possible. I hope that you found this information helpful. I hope you were able to find something beneficial from it and thank you for your time. Next week on Families Divided TV, Chris Turner discusses preventing the effects of alienation through early identification and intervention.